So today's speaker is Susan Parks. Uh, Susan Parks was a, uh, is going to talk about uh, some vocalization behavior of baleen whales, primarily right whales. If you know anything about right whales, they like to migrate from north to south. And Susan, in her uh, educational career, has also done that migration. She did her undergraduate in Cornell, uh, then went to grad school in Witz Hole, so it's very shallow migration. Then she migrated back north to Cornell for a postdoc. Then she migrated south to Penn State, where she was a research scientist. And then recently, she migrated back up north uh, to Syracuse, where she's now a faculty person, faculty member, faculty uh, in the biology department at Syracuse. Um, and Susan's going to have a very interesting talk with some really cool uh, 3D graphics showing how whales move underwater. No? Check them out. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, right. <laughs> um, she's not. Uh, but she will have uh, some cool whale noises. And one thing Susan doesn't like to brag about herself is she actually doesn't always need to play the sounds. She can actually imitate many of the sounds herself. Um, and she does an excellent right whale gunshot. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Susan. Thank you, Jeff. Whoa, you have a no, I turned that off. Okay. This is very loud. But all right. Well, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research with baleen whales, um, and particularly today I wanted to focus on applying behavioral ecology to the conservation of baleen whales. So not just focusing on their vocalizations, but actually focusing on how studying behavior can teach us something about animals in a way to better conserve them, better manage their population. So it's not just studying the behavior, but it's actually an applied use of it. So first I want to sort of set the stage of why study baleen whales. Um, I often get this question, particularly from small children. Um, so right whales are, or whales in general, are sort of charismatic megafauna, and that's why people think I study them. And in fact, I didn't actually develop an, an interest in studying whales until I was in <coughs> grad school. Um, not that I had anything against whales. But what came up is that whale, baleen whales really are sort of the superlative of mammals. And so if you think about a lot of different behavioral or life history characteristics, whales are at the extreme end. And so if we talk about um, longevity in mammals, for example, the longest lived mammals are marine mammals. If we talk about complex social and mating systems, baleen whales have actually evolved a number of different mating strategies to deal with their sort of long life histories and their long migrations. And so there's a variety of mating tactics from scramble competition, lack advertisement, female advertisement, male advertisement. And so within a, a group of just 11 species, you have a really wide diversity of mating systems. They've evolved a sophisticated use of acoustics for communication. And so some of you might be familiar with song, for example, um, humpback whale song is something that a lot of people have heard about. And so there's these complex songs that are population specific and change, all the individuals in the population know the same song, but they change year to year. And so it's really interesting. But there's also, um, baleen whales also make the lowest frequency sounds of any mammalian um, species. And they also make the loudest sounds of any mammalian species. So we're always sort of pushing the far end of the envelope in terms of, of their biology. They have highly specialized feeding behavior, so they feed on, on relatively small organisms, um, some that Joe studies, well, all of them that Joe study. Um, <laughs> very small zooplankton up to a fairly sizable little fish, um, and they just take them by the mouthful or strain them out of the water. And so they have evolved feeding mechanisms, and, and they're called baleen whales because of their baleen plates that they've evolved. And so they have really interesting feeding. And so the reason I wanted to study baleen whales in my research is really that there are new tools available, and there are long-term data sets available about these species that make it possible to actually do science. So rather than just doing observational studies, you can collect data, you can have a reasonable sample size, you can see what the animals are doing underwater, um, and you can collect data to actually test hypotheses. And so since these animals are sort of at the extreme end of a lot of these biological traits, it was really interesting to me. And I'm also interested in conservation, and so most of these baleen whale species, since they were great for oil um, and baleen, uh, are highly endangered due to human, human influence over the past couple of centuries. Um, and so there are a lot of endangered species and populations, and so learning more about them to enhance their conservation is something that appeals to me. Um, they're also bigger than school buses, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, So if you go out on the water and you're next to a whale, and it's, you know, if the whale's under the boat, you see in the small boats that I work in, usually we're in 24, 25 foot boats. If there's a whale under the boat, you see a whale in front of you, you see a whale to the right, you see a whale to the left, a whale behind you, and it's just one whale. 
So it's, it's sort of awe-inspiring to be on the water with them. So the sort of tack that I want to take today is talking about conservation behavior. And so this is a picture of a book that came out in 2010 <coughs> called Primer of Conservation Behavior. And it sort of synthesizes this idea of using behavioral ecology information and applying that to solve conservation and management problems. And so you might be able to think of ways that this is actually integrated into your life. I don't know if you guys have a problem with crows on your campus during migration, but at Penn State and at Syracuse University, crows over winter and pick roosts that are usually on campus. And when you have a thousand crows roosting in your trees, they kind of make a mess. And so both campuses have been really motivated to move the crows off campus. And they actually use behavioral, um, conservation behavior principles that they're using alarm calls and distress calls from crows to try to discourage them from roosting. It doesn't work, and they usually end up with pyrotechnic results, but <laughs> they started with a conservation behavior approach. Um, so my talk today is really going to touch on, on four different studies that I've worked on over the past decade, and the first one is the one that I collaborated with Joe on, looking at the foraging ecology of North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales in Cape Cod Bay. Then I'm going to move on to talk about a comparison of humpback and right whale behavior, vocalization behavior on their feeding grounds. Then I'm going to talk about impacts of noise on a, a whale communication. So this is sort of where the conservation aspect of my research comes in. And then I'll talk about a current project that we have going on that's looking at the behavior of right whale mother calf pairs and the ontogeny of behavior as a calf develops. So for the first project talking about forage ecology of North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales, particularly at Stellwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And so the idea for the study was to, to look at whales in this box. And so the motivation of the study was to see how endangered humpback whales and right whales make their living on Stellag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And so if you're not familiar with Stellag and Bank, Boston is here. It's just offshore of Boston. It's a great place for whale watching. And so it's a sanctuary, but there's a lot of human activity in this sanctuary. Um, and Cape Cod is just coming in right here. And this was a fairly large project with collaborators from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Whale Center of New England, Stony Brook, <coughs> Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies, Duke University, and the University of New Hampshire. So it was a pretty big team. So first, the players. North Atlantic right whales, this is a slide I've been using for a while, but it's an endangered species. Um, I'd say fewer than 350 individuals, but I can actually now upgrade the slide. There were about 500 North Atlantic right whales now. Um, in the past decade, they've had sort of a baby boom, and there's been a number of individuals born. Um, so it's still a small population. The entire North Atlantic has about 500 North Atlantic right whales in it. They're in a high, habitat with high human use, so they're <coughs> migrating off the east coast of the United States, and so we find them in their feeding grounds in the northern um, Gulf of Maine. Some of them go up to Nova Scotia, um, Gulf of St. Lawrence. Then they migrate along the coastal route down to Florida and Georgia where they have their cattle and mating grounds. And so this is sort of the, they span the, the east coast of the US primarily, and so they're crossing a lot of major shipping roads. And they have a problem that they've been, there's been a moratorium on hunting right whales since 1935, but there's still a lot of human-induced mortality from collisions with vessels, and so they sort of just swim along and get hit by big ships, which isn't so good for a right whale. And they also swim and their mouths open to feed, and so they get tangled in a lot of the lines from fishing gear, and essentially a lot of individuals die from that. They either drown or they, they die the death of a thousand cuts and, and sort of get a chronic and, and tangent, entanglement. Um, and it's a well-studied population with known life history for all individuals since 1980. This is what was appealing to me in, in when I started studying this species because you can take a photograph of a right whale and there's a catalog maintained by the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium. And you can take that photograph and find out who that individual is. And you can find out how old they are, if they've been born since 1980. We know who their mother is. And from genetic testing, we actually know who their father is, we know how they're related. And so if you take a picture of a group of whales interacting, you can take a photograph and you can figure out, is it a mother with their offspring? Are they cousins? Are they mating? You, know, you can get a lot of information just from photographs. And this is something that wasn't really possible in early marine mammal research. And their mating system is fairly interesting. My PhD work was actually on their, their mating groups. And they seem to have a structure that's focused around female advertisement that brings in males to compete, and the males compete through sperm competition for fertilization. So it's sort of an unusual mating system. The other species is the North Atlantic humpback whales. And so this is also endangered species. If you go out on whale watches, you might not really think of humpbacks as endangered, but they, they are still an endangered species. Um, there are about 12,000 humpbacks in the entire North Atlantic, but the Gulf of Maine population is about 800 individuals. And this population has been growing, so it's considered fairly robust and healthy. So it's been growing about 3.5% a year. They also have habitat in high human use areas. They also migrate up and down the east coast of the United States, calving and mating down in the Caribbean. 
It's a well-studied population with well-known life histories for most individuals since 1976. There's a catalog maintained um, by uh, the College of the Atlantic. And so they actually have information on relatedness, though in this population it's primarily maternal relatedness. They don't have maternity for a lot of the individuals since that requires genetic testing, but they do have maternity um, information. And they have a different mating system, prim primarily, people think, dominated by male advertisement and direct scramble competition for access to mating agreements. And so they're, they're interesting that they have similar lifestyles and simil similar habitats, but they have different mating systems and they have different um, foraging behaviors. And so it's an interesting contrast for these two species. So the question that we were asking in the study <clears throat> is whether the differences in the normal behavior of these species affect their conservation. Why are humpback whales doing well and right whales aren't doing well in the same habitat area? And so the types of things that we were looking at in the study are diving behavior. So we want to know when is the whale at the surface? So when are these whales detectable? Are right whales less detectable visually when they're on a boat so they're, they're easier to hit? Um, we wanted to know when they spent time at depth that they could be hit by ships but not seen at the surface, so when they're just subsurface. We wanted to know when they spent time near the bottom where they could get entangled in ground lines from fishing gear. And then in terms of their vocalizations, we were interested in the sounds that they produce. So humpback song is well described, but there's been less data published on the social sounds that these whales use for communication in humpback whales. And then in right whales, again, we have a lot of data on sounds that they use in these sort of mating groups in the summer but less information about their spring feeding behavior and sound production. So we're interested in the call types for both species and also the call rates. So do they make a lot of sound? Will a passive listening device allow you to find a humpback whale or a right whale in the feeding ground? Or are they really quiet? So those are the sort of questions we were asking in this study. So first, humpback whale feeding is really conspicuous. If any of you have been on a whale watch on Stellwagen Bank in the summer, they do a lot of surface feeding during the day. And so this picture is looking at a humpback whale doing bubble net feeding at the surface. You see a lot of green water, you see white water from the bubbles coming up, you see a lot of birds honing in on this. And so there's a really a big visual signal, so it's pretty easy to find feeding humpback whales. You get a little closer when they're coming up out of the water. Um, if you were close enough, you could see that there's some sand lance jumping out of this whale's mouth as it's coming up to the surface to engulf prey. And again, if you get multiple individuals in a group, these are really big visual used to find a humpback whale. So in terms of getting hit by a ship, they're, they're pretty well off. Um, right whales feeding in Cape Cod Bay um, in April are about in similar behavior. So I don't know if you can see on this picture, it's a pretty calm day. This light patch is the top of the rostrum of a right whale, and this light patch is their tongue, so its mouth's open. So there's a right whale feeding right next to the boat. And so this is you know, a pretty good look at a right whale. This is a right whale right next to the boat, and you know you can see it underwater because it's a clear day, clear calm day. You have polarizers on the lens, but if it was slightly rough at all, you'd have no idea that that right whale was right was there. So they're really difficult and cryptic to detect when they're in this spring feeding habitat. And sometimes they get all the way up to the surface when the prey actually makes a slip right below or at the surface. They'll come and they'll actually lift their mouth out of the water. And then there's a little bit of a visual profile for detecting them, but really they only get their upper part of their rostrum. They don't have birds coming in on the prey. They don't have a lot of white water splashing. You'll just see a little bit of the whale coming out of the water. And so just visually, we had a sense that there was a difference in the forest <coughs> behavior between these two species in terms of being cryptic or not. So for the, this particular project, we collected data using the D-tag, which is an acoustic recording tag. And this is a picture of the tag being held by one of, one of the researchers. Um, they're fairly small, and it, it primarily was focused to collect acoustic recordings on a, ta on a whale. And so essentially, it's a suction cup tag that we put on the whale that's continuously recording the acoustic environment. So we can record the sounds from the whale that the whale makes. We can also record the sounds in the environment that the whale hears. So we can hear boats coming near the whale. We can hear other whales coming close to the whale. Um, and we can also get information on the acceleration, orientation, and pressure to attract the subsurface whale behavior, which is really nice. So you don't just get an idea of what the whales are doing at the surface when they're feeding, but you can actually recreate their track underwater. And so for this study, um, it was conducted in uh, four field seasons in July 2008 and 2009, and then in April of 2009. And so the humpback whales were the focus in the July field feeding season, and then the right whales were the focus in April, so, so primarily there in the spring. So we were able to tag some humpback whales that were also there feeding during the April field season. And so in terms of data, we were able to tag 35 humpback whales over those two, su two summers, and we had over 200 hours of data. Eight tags stayed on overnight, so we can actually see what the whales are doing between day and night, which is really interesting. Um, usually when 
you're doing whale behavioral ecology, you're out there on a nice calm day during the day, so we don't really get a good sense of what they do at night. And we also had three tags from April. Right whales, um, they're more endangered, so that could be the reason that we have fewer tags. But uh, we had 16 tags on right whales, uh, 27 hours of data. So right whales are really flexible, so they're these large sort of chubby whales, but they're incredibly flexible. And so in, in Cape Cod Bay, you put a suction cup tag on a whale, and a suction cup tag stays on really well if you have a flat surface. Um, and so humpback whales are fairly rigid. Right whales fold and bend in really interesting ways, and so they're really good at popping the tags off. The goal was to try to actually look at right whale behavior at night, and every evening in the afternoon when it looked like we had a, a tag that might stay on into the night, they would either socialize with another whale or start doing these really tight turns where they flex their entire body and the tags just popped off. So we still, it's still a mystery what right whales do at night. And then we were also collecting data on behavioral sequencing, so seeing what they were doing from the surface so we could tie that in with what we were getting from the tag and photo ID so we know who the whale was. And so this is sort of the procedure of putting on the tag. Um, so as I said, we we're usually in small boats, so this was a 26-foot rib. And then we have a 55-foot pole that we put out um, that has sort of a counterbalance here, and we have a red whale that's about to get tagged. And so we would just slowly approach the whale and lower the pole off the back, and the suction cups would hang on and then pull the pole off and leave the tag on the whale, hopefully, when it worked. <clears throat> so there have been some previous studies published on foraging behavior of right whale, of humpback whales from Stellwagen and Bank. This was a paper by Ari Friedlander et al. in 2009, which was also looking at Stellwagen and Bank humpbacks in the summer. And so this is a 3D representation of data taken off of a tag, looking at humpback whale feeding during the day and at the surface and at night on the bottom. And so I'll just walk you through these. So this track is recreating the track that the, the whale took through the water using the tag data. So essentially these flat parts are when the whale's at the surface, and then these tracks are showing the whale going on dives. The yellow indicates when the whale rolled more than 45 degrees, either to the left or the right. So it's just indicating places where there was a change in the pitch or the roll of the animal. And so these two plots were showing typical bubble net surface feeding in the humpback whales. So they would come and they would take a dive and do a large loop at the base, come up to the top, dive down again, and do a shallow loop through the middle and come back up with their mouths open, eating the prey that was presumably corralled within that first bubble net that they blew. And as you can see sort of from this plot, they do the same behavior in a very stereotyped manner over and over and over and over again. And if you get a long tag, you can sort of zoom out with this program called track plot and just see what the animal did over the course of 12 or 15 hours. When you look at what the animals were doing at night, they'd actually completely change their behavior, so they're not doing the surface feeding at night, they're doing bottom feeding, and so their, their flat part here is when the whales at the surface, then they're going to the bottom, and these yellow points indicate when the whales were rolling actually in the sediment, you can hear sand in the tag. And again, you can see they're doing the same behavior over and over and over again, and so these were really tied to the day-night cycles with the humpback whales, and so there's a really big difference between day and night behavior. And if we're talking about conservation behavior, so these bubble net feeding during the day is very visible. There's whales at the surface, there's white water that bubbles, there's birds, and so they're very visible to ships that are coming. At night, the whales aren't spending much time at the surface at all. They're spending most of their time at the bottom. And so in, in this conservation context, the normal feeding ecology of humpback whales puts them at a reduced risk for ship strike because they're at the surface, when they're at the surface during the day, they're very visible, and at night when you wouldn't be able to see them anyways, they're not spending much time at the surface. And so it's, it's fortunate for the the humpback whales, but their normal behavior puts them at less risk. Right whales, on the other hand, um, we don't have any nighttime data, so we don't know how much it changes, but they are also tracking their prey. So the humpback whales were corralling fish, the right whales are eating copepods, and so this is a track plot of a right whale in Cape Cod Bay, and it's a lot less interesting. Um, you see lines going back and forth, but what you don't see are dives, and so essentially these whales weren't diving. They were just staying at one depth, which was just subsurface, and mowing the lawn. So if we zoom out, we can look at the entire track from about six hours of one whale over a two kilometer stretch, and they're just going back and forth mowing the lawn and eating just subsurface. And so we don't know what they're doing at night, but if you look at the prey, it suggests that they're tracking the prey, and if the prey is just subsurface, they're probably doing the same thing at night. Doesn't really matter either way, the whales are just subsurface, so you're not gonna see them. So it puts them potentially at increased risk for ship strike. So this was a paper that Joe and I published um, with some collaborators from the Center for Coastal Studies and Stella Stel Bank National Marine Sanctuary last year. And so this was taking the tag data just from the right whales to look at percent times spent at depth and the depth in meters. And what you can see is that there are all these peaks from the tags of the right whales that all the individuals that we tagged stayed with their backs less than five meters from the surface most of the time that the tags were attached. 
And then if you look at the prey data from Joe, you actually see that the peak in, in abundance of cocoa pod numerical density is at the same depth that the whale was spending all of its time, which really wasn't surprising, but it's just a nice sort of confirmation that the whales are spending their time where they're eating and they're eating where their prey is. So if you can track the prey, you're gonna know a little bit about the behavior of the whale. So this, this behavior really puts right whales in an increased risk for ship strike. And this is a direct comparison of humpback whale and right whale data um, looking at just the dive depth from the tag. So we have depth on this axis, so five meters, 10 meters, 15 meters, and percent time on this axis, so it's sort of turned around from the last figure. The blue line shows right whales, and the yellow line shows humpback whales. And what you can see is that right whales, nine, over 90% of the time, was spent just subsurface in about two meters of water depth for the back. And then if you look at humpback whales in the same bin, they're spending about 41% of their time at the same depth, so they're back at that depth. And so the humpback whales are using more of the water column, and again, they're still spending some time at the bottom, so that's sort of an, another analysis we're working on now is to see how much time humpback whales are spending just above the bottom where they could potentially get entangled in fishing gear. And so that's a slightly more difficult uh, analysis because you, you have to have a geo-reference track, so you have to know exactly where the well was to know what depth the water was to see how far it is above the bottom. Whereas when you're just looking at depth from the surface, you always know where the surface is, so that one's pretty straightforward. Um, but essentially what it looks like is that humpback whale foraging behavior puts them at less risk, risk for ship strikes, at least on sail like a bank, and then we still have to look at the, the risk for entanglement with fishing gear. So the next part of the talk is really talking about the vocal behavior of these same humpback and right whales that we tagged on sail like a bank. So was there something about the vocal behavior of the two species that would make them detectable? So one thing that people have been doing a lot over the past decade is using passive acoustic recorders, so essentially just putting out a recorder on the bottom and listening to the environment to detect what's there. The problem with that is that you're only gonna detect what something that's making sounds, and you have to know what sounds it makes. And so with humpback whales, there's not a really good um, catalog of uh, feeding sounds that they make on the feeding grounds, and so people don't necessarily know what sounds are from humpback whales. And again, we don't really know what the rate of sound production is, and so that was sort of the goal of this analysis. So for humpback whales, um, addition, in addition to their sort of positive benefit of not being in the area that they're gonna hit by ships, they're also really chatty. They made a lot of sounds, they made a wide variety of sounds, and they have really high call rates. And so I'll just play a clip. This is a clip of sort of eight categories of sound types that were produced by humpback whales on Stella the Bank. That's a wide variety of sounds. Um, so you have pretty low frequency sounds with these tones, you have some buzzes, you have some sort of click sounds that you would, wouldn't think they were necessarily produced by an animal. And so the nice thing with a tag is we can actually get these multiple examples of these same call types from multiple whales to have fairly high confidence that they are produced by humpback whales. So we, we sort of expanded the catalog of known sounds. And what was really interesting to me is, did, it, did anyone think that that sounded like humpback whale song? <laughs> no. So, if you detected these sounds and you were thinking humpback whale song, you wouldn't necessarily think that this was a humpback whale producing these sounds. And the, the humpback sounds were really interesting because if you're doing acoustic analysis, usually people are talking about tonal sounds that are sort of sinusoidal and measuring peak frequency and things like that. Most of the sounds that the humpbacks were making on Selig Bank were actually pulsatile calls, and so they're just rapid pulses. So the sort of buzzy sounds that you were hearing in here are just these sort of click type sounds faster. And so it's really interesting and it says something maybe about their sound production mechanism. Humpback whales also click at night while they're feeding. And so if anyone's familiar with uh, acoustics in marine mammals, you usually think of clicking with echolocation and you think of this primarily just in odonises that they produce clicks to receive the echoes back from their food. Humpback whales, when they're feeding on the bottom, when they're doing those bottom rolls, make these clicking sounds. And so we're really actively looking right now to see what the function is. First, I'll play the sound. rhythm, but they're not really intense, and they're very low frequency, and so in terms of using something for echolocation, they're not really exactly what we would expect. So some of the hypotheses we're testing it, it, are whether they use these sounds to startle their prey out of the sediment. So for example, they're feeding on sand lands. Would this sound startle the sand lands out of the sand? That would be kind of odd, since you'd think their startle response would be to go into the sand. 
um, or the other thing that we're actually testing is whether they use the sound to coordinate. A lot of these whales that were tagged were tagged with two whales cooperatively feeding, or maybe not cooperatively, but two whales that were traveling together consistently and feeding together. And so what we're seeing is that the whales that are making these paired burst sounds seem to be making them when they're with another whale. So we're wondering if this is timing and coordination of when they do those roles. So if you put the two tag records together, you often, often see really, really carefully timed um, synchronized rolling behaviors where they might be scaring prey towards each other. And so perhaps they're using this type of sound for coordination. Is that two whales making the That's one whale. That's one. But we have other examples where you hear two different whales making the paired bursts at the same time. Um, but you always have these sounds um, end immediately before you hear sand. And so there's there's a high coordination with the sound with an actual foraging roll attempt. Right whales, on the other hand, um, are the strong silent type of whales. And I've been telling people this for years, which is why I you know, need more money to collect more data, because if you want a lot of right whale calls, you have to listen for a long time. <laughs> Um, foraging right whales are quiet. Essentially, we have no calls detected from any of the whales that were actively feeding doing this sort of lawnmower pattern just subsurface. We did get 14 calls from one whale, and that was when that whale was heading in a beeline towards a social group of right whales. And so perhaps we know that the sound that that whale was making was something that they used for contact calls, for long distance contact calls. But I'll play three examples of, of clips compiled from multiple right whales um, so that we hear the difference in their sound production. but those are the social sounds that right whales are producing when they're feeding around. So how do the call rates compare between the two species? Um, so if you're using passive acoustic monitoring to detect whales on the feeding ground, humpback whales are great. We got on average about 88 calls per individual per hour. Um, right whales are in blue. Who can see them? There they are. 1.4 calls per hour on average from the 13 individuals. Um, and so, and, and that is actually driven a lot by this bout of 19 calls from one individual. Most of the individuals had zero calls um, during long tag records. And so passive acoustic monitoring for an individual right whale is poor. That's not to say that if there are multiple right whales in an area, you won't detect something, but you're not gonna detect it from a whale that's feeding. So right whale um, behavior makes their conservation challenging. And this is sort of one of the take home stories that I've been, been telling managers, it's, it's their lot in life, I guess, being, being with their social system and their foraging system really sort of puts them at a disadvantage. They spend less time visible at the surface, um, depends on their prey in other habitat areas, it's not the same, so their prey can be at depth, and so they'll spend a lot of time deep diving, for example, in the Bay of Fundy. But in Cape Cod Bay, they're just subsurface a lot of the time. So humpback whales are safer in the Stellar Bank area and their foraging than white whales are. In terms of, um, Time spent uh, visible at the surface, humpbacks are more visible, humpbacks are at safer depths, and in terms of sound production rates, acoustic detection of humpbacks is a lot easier than right whales. And so right whales have everything going for them, or humpbacks have everything going for them, right whales not so much. So the next topic I'm gonna to talk about is noise impacts on right whale communication, and so this is actually looking at the detailed communication between individuals. So my research um, primarily has been looking at this diagram for, the, for a while. Um, looking at the signals produced by a particular individual to describe the repertoire, try to figure out the behavioral si significance of, that, of those sounds, um, look at individual identity and source levels so we can sort of characterize the signals for passive acoustic detection and understand their behavior. And I've also done research on the receiver side, so actually doing anatomical modeling of their ears to estimate hearing abilities. It's really hard to give a hearing test to a bailing whale. Um, and people are really getting geared up to, to do um, electrophysiological measurements, if there's ever a, uh, an, a cat, for example, that strands alive. But to date, no one's been able to get a hearing test on a, on a live right whale. And I've also done playback experiments where you play a sound back that you think has a particular function, and you see who responds and how to try, sort of ask the question, does this sound mean what I think it does? And then this impact of noise of communication really comes in on how do these signals get to the receiver, and, and what's the impact on the, the communication system. So right whales spend a lot of time near vessels. So this is a right whale social group. There are about four whales there. Um, this was a picture that I took in 2002, and we were recording this group for about an hour, and this ship actually um, deviated its path. It was heading right for us in our small little boat at very high speeds, and it's amazing. These things can corner. Like, they turned like 30 degrees to starboard about a mile from us and went around us, no problem. They always say they're not maneuverable, but 
it's not that big a shift, but they were going pretty fast. So ambient noise levels in the ocean have actually been increasing, so people have been looking at this more. Um, it's sort of hindsight in which they had more data 50 years ago, but um, for the data that people do have in particular sites, if you go back and measure the noise now, there's been a pretty steady increase that people have documented over the past 50 years from human activities. And this has really gone hand in hand with an increase in shipping activity, and so the, the hypothesis is that most of this noise increase in low frequency sound is coming from increased shipping. So this is a, a figure showing ship rated, no, radiated noise in the Mediterranean from about 50 um, commercial ships. And so we have frequency on this axis from zero to 1200 hertz. And then we have the level of the noise here, so the amplitude. And so what you can see is the peak energy of the noise is below 250 hertz from the ships. And this, these two color bands are the um, frequency range of right whale calls. So there are up calls, so this, the first call that you heard, the mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So very easy up call. And then the tonal, which I won't do because it sounds like elephants screaming. Um, <laughs> so these tonal calls have higher frequency calls. And so these may be less impacted by ship noise, but the up calls really fall right on the peak energy of the noise from shipping. So we want to quantify the noise in right whale environments and assess the impact on these contact calls. And it's particularly concerning because we know that all individuals in the North Atlantic right whale population use this contact call. So we know that calves use it with their mothers when they're separated. We know that males use it with females when they're coming into these mating groups. And so it's something that could impact every individual in the population if there's a, a sort of masking effect on these up calls. So um, I'll play an up call example for you. It's not really that different than the one I made. And then here is one of these variable tone calls. Yeah, so which I don't usually imitate. I'll work on it. But um, so these tone calls are also primarily produced, it seems, by females in these reproductive groups. So it's again, it's a smaller subset of the population if you detect these calls. It's not necessarily going to get you everybody. Whereas with up calls, it could be a cat, it could be a female, it could be a male, it could be a gene. So in terms of noise masking, again, just another visualization. If you overlay the noise over the up call, that's sort of a shadow. Um, the up call practically disappears, whereas if you put the same frequency band of noise over the tonal calls, it doesn't really have all that much impact on the, the distribution of the frequencies and the energy in the call. So if whales are changing their vocalizations to compensate for ship noise, there are a number of ways that they can do this. There's been a lot of research um, in humans, for example, there's been research on how we change our vocalizations in noisy places, like the cocktail effect, if anyone's heard about this, the Lombard effect. We tend to talk louder, so we increase our call amplitude. Um, we increase the call frequency. Actually, think about it if you're in a noisy room, you actually talk at a slightly higher pitch. You should try to record yourself if you actually took out the background noise. It sounds kind of funny. Um, and sometimes people increase the duration of certain words that they're emphasizing um, if they're trying to be heard. And so what we wanted to test is whether whales did this. Um, so take a stereotypical right whale up call, so just saying the times on the x-axis and frequency on the y. So say we have this sound contour, and then you in, in, impose noise from ships. If you increase the call amplitude, the signal to noise ratio still stays pretty good if you're, allowed, if you're able to compensate for the background noise. If you increase the call frequency, so if you shift the call up out of the noise, you still maintain some of your signal to noise ratio, so that might work. But if you increase the call duration without shifting the frequency or getting louder, you really sort of don't get any release from this masking. You're still going to be masked because getting a longer call and noise isn't going to do anything. And so the prediction for the study was really that we'd find increases in call amplitude, we'd find increases in call frequency in response to low frequency noise, and we wouldn't necessarily ex expect an increase in call duration unless it's something that's maybe linked physiologically to the other two. So for the studies that I'm going to talk about, um, it really um, relies on the global asymmetry in shipping activity. And so this is a really nice figure from Halpern et al. in Science in 2008. And you can go in and, and map your particular anthropogenic impact. So you can map pollution, you can map all sorts of different things. Um, here is a map of shipping activity. And so the red is really high, sort of high traffic shipping lanes. Blue, or blue is low traffic information. White is where they have no data. But what you can see is essentially there's this network of yellow and red across the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. But in the Southern Hemisphere, there's relatively little ship traffic. This is changing. I mean, this was from 2008. And um, there has been an increase in shipping in the Pacific. And then this traffic line between Asia and around Africa is increasing. And again, to Brazil, for example, the shipping is increasing. But compared to the Northern Hemisphere, it's sort of small. 
small number of vessels. And so what I wanted to focus on was, can you compare the acoustic environments in the North Atlantic to the South Atlantic? Because in the North Atlantic, to study noise impacts on North Atlantic right whales, you would really like to find a quiet place and a loud place. And nowhere I've been is North Atlantic right whales is quiet, unless you're in the shallow water in the Southeast, and that's only quiet because it's shallow, so the sounds don't propagate very well because of the low frequency. So the study that we conducted was a comparison of Northern and Southern Hemisphere calling through time. There's another species of right whale in the Southern Hemisphere that have a very similar social system. They look virtually identical. There's one jawbone that's different. Genetically, they're distinct. They've been separated for a long time, but um, morphologically and acoustically and behaviorally, they're very similar. And so for this study, we were able to obtain recordings from Bill Watkins and Bill Cheville at Woods Hole Oceanographic that were recorded in 1956 in Vineyard Sound. So we actually have calls from right whales from the 1950s in the North Atlantic when it was quiet. And we have recordings from my thesis um, in the Bay of Fundy, Canada from 2000 from the same population. And then in Southern right whales in 1977, Chris Clark from Cornell University did his PhD on Southern right whales. And so he had a large number of recordings um, from a really remote, um, very quiet location in uh, Patagonia, and then in 2000, his lab went back to Argentina to collect more recordings. And so in both sites, we have a comparison through time when we know there's been an increase in human activities, and we also have a comparison between the North Atlantic, which should be noisy, and the Southern Atlantic, which should be quieter. The things that we don't have are calibrated noise measurements from the two habitats, which would be great, and we also don't have source level measurements from the whales, because the whales that were recorded were recorded from single recording devices, so we don't know how far away they were from the recorder. So we can't actually get out the question of whether the whales are calling louder. So what we wanted to focus on was a frequency difference between the two species. And so in the South Atlantic in 1977 and the North Atlantic in 2000, the start frequency, so this minimum frequency of the up call, had shifted by almost an octave, um, or was shifted by almost an octave. And so this was sort of, this happened when I went to a postdoc with, Cornell, with Chris at Cornell and I was listening to his recordings from Argentina, and I was like, is there something wrong with the tapes? Like, are they playing slowly? Because these whales are getting sort of lower in frequency and pitch. So I'll first play that for you to listen to that difference. So the North Atlantic right whale up call sort of starts where the Southern right whale up calls were ending in 1977. And so that's, this is this sort of, this figure in that, that those clips are what started and so when we put in the data from the North Atlantic in 1956, and I'll be honest, there, there's not that much data. So there were six days that they were not recording. And so maybe they recorded from five or six different whales. We don't know how many individuals were involved. But in 1956, the start frequency in the North Atlantic was much closer to the start frequency in the Southern Hemisphere. So that was really intriguing. So we wanted to pull in the data from 2000 in the South Atlantic and see, did you see a shift in frequency through time in the Southern population as well? And so what we found is in the southern right whale, from 1977 to 2000, there was a shift from about 65 hertz, 69 hertz to 77 hertz um, for southern right whale starting uh, up calls. And then in the North Atlantic, it went from 70 to 101 hertz for the average starting frequency of their calls. And so again, this study, we don't have really good control over what the noise levels were. We don't have measurements of source level. But it was indicative of a trend in changes in calls that might have been a result of noise the one thing that was interesting is there was no significant difference between North Atlantic right whales and Southern right whales in the sort of older recordings, but there's still a difference um, today. The 2000 North Atlantic right whale frequency is significantly higher than Southern right whales are today. Um, I should go back and say there are obviously alternative hypotheses for this, and so we've been moving forward testing this. And um, one thing that people have talked about is that both populations are recovering and growing, so is frequency of the up call tied to the age of the individual, for example? Do bigger individuals make lower frequency calls? Um, if that was the case, you'd kind of expect a, a, a trend like this because there are more juveniles in the population than there were 20 years ago because a lot of, a lot of reproduction has sort of changed the, the demographics of the population. Um, so this is just suggestive of a change in response to noise because it, you know, it, it, it supports our hypothesis but it's definitely not proving the point. So the next study that we wanted to do was look at individual behavior and look at how an individual whale changed its calls by attaching a D-tag to right whales in the Bay of Fundy um, from 2001, 2002, and in 2005. And so we've already gone through the D-tags, but we put the D-tags on the backs of right whales, and we had 14 tags out of 70 tags um, that had more than one call on them. 
so that we could test whether an individual changed their call with changes in the background noise on the tag. And so tags are great for assessing noise compensation because then we can see does an individual change its behavior and we can measure the source level. So we know an individual, we know who made the call, we can measure the noise level that the whale heard when it made that call <coughs> on the tag with some caveats about flow noise. And then we also have precise time and frequency measurements. The problems are that we don't know where right whales make their sound in their body. We don't actually know how baleen whales make sound. There's some hypotheses out there and they're anatomically based, but there's still no, no real definitive answer on how baleen whales make their loud, low frequency sounds. So we don't know where the tag is relative to the sound source in the whale. And we also don't know what the propagation effects are um, of the sound propagating through the whale to the back of the whale. So what we really had to look at was individual records. We couldn't pull out what the actual source level of the calls were. We had to look within one tag record with the tag in the same location on the whale. Did the calls get louder or quieter? Did the frequency shift up or down? So this figure answers everything. So this is uh, two calls from one individual. I always put it up front, and then every time it comes up, I'm like, why am I showing you any data? Um, so there are two calls from one individual. This is the quiet call. This is the call when there was noise in the background from a ship nearby. Um, if you're familiar with spectrograms, so the more intense sounds are colored sort of more brightly. So yellow is really intense, red is more intense than, yellow is more intense than red, red is more intense than purple. And so what you can see here is that the same call type has a similar frequency, it's change in duration, but it got a lot louder. So I can, again, play it so you can read it. So, Nothing's modified. Those were two sounds recorded off the same whale, and the call was louder than the second one. So your ears are better than any processing that I can do, really. So what we did is we looked at the noise levels received on the tag, and so we measured the broadband noise levels um, from 20 hertz to 8 kilohertz on the tag, but then we had varying sample rates. So that was sort of the standard sampling rate that we had to go on. And the noise levels, um, the band level noise varied from 92 to 143 dB um, RMS, which was a pretty wide range of noise. And so these are showing the spectrum of the noise from um, the third octave band center frequencies. So low noise, we have pretty quiet conditions on some of the tags. And then in high noise, what, you, what I really want to emphasize here is that the high noise and the high intensity sounds were really coming in this lower frequency region. So if you're a right while making an up call, say the up call normal receive level would be here, to get above the high noise, you'd either have to shift like three octaves, so you'd sound like Mickey Mouse, or you just call louder. Um, and so what we expected in this scenario is if you're matching the call to what solution would actually get them a release from the masking, we predict, predicted that they call louder. And there might be a shift in frequency, but it wasn't going to get them above this noise because it would be a really significant shift. So what we found for minimum frequency, so that minimum frequency of the up call versus noise level, was something that was not really significant. Um, for a mixed model, it said it was significant, but it, there wasn't a huge change. In the high noise category, if you put it and lumped them into categories, there was a slight change in the minimum frequency of the call, but the low and mid frequency um, didn't really see much of a difference. For call intensity and noise, if we're plotting each individual in a different symbol, and then you're looking at the regression here, um, you see that there's a trend towards louder calls in louder noise. And what's interesting is that you don't see these higher intensity calls. This is call intensity on this axis. You don't see high call intensity calls at low noise levels. And so to me, that's even more important than this sort of trend towards louder calls and louder conditions is that they don't make these loud calls when it's quiet. So there's sort of two lines of evidence that they seem to be increasing the call amplitude when the noise levels are going up. And the mixed model actually supported that increase in call noise uh, call level and increasing noise independent of individual effects and the variation. So for a summary of noise effects, we see a modification of calling behavior that should maximize the, de the detectability of signal and noise. So if you have really low frequency sound for right whales, shifting out of that frequency isn't a huge deal and they seem to be able to do that. But if it's loud and they can't really shift out of the noise because it's a broad band noise, they seem to call louder. What we can't really test with the old recordings is whether they also called louder when it got noisier in the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic because those data aren't available. 
Long-term changes really indicate a gradual upward shift in frequency of the stereotype contact call in right whales. And what's interesting for me in this is, again, since right whales are really long-lived, some of the individuals that were reported in 1956 could have been the same individuals I was reporting in 2000. That's well within the known lifespan of right whales. So we're not talking about an evolution of a population. We didn't have a turnover of individuals in the population that there's a shift in the frequency of the call. We're talking about a behavioral response of individuals. So this all occurred over the lifespan of one or two generations. So it's really interesting, suggesting that long-term changes in ambient background noise are something that whales are compensating for behaviorally. There may also be an evolutionary selection pressure towards higher frequency calls, but at this point, really, we're suggesting there's a behavioral change. And also that individual right whales increase call intensity over the short term, but frequency changes seem to vary between individuals. So that the, the result that I had that was sort of whether they changed the frequency or not, if, you, if I put up a plot, um, some individuals shifted their frequency up quite significantly, like 100 hertz, some of them shifted it down. And so when you actually do a model looking at the change, there's no trend towards changing the, the frequency up. So it didn't really make a whole lot of sense what was going on with the frequency shift. So it was less consistent than the intensity. And then the long-term implications for these call mod modifications are what needs to be taken into account from this sort of conservation um, standpoint that you really need to figure out Will these call modifications make an individual less attractive? Will it change the ability of other whales to identify that call or because they've shifted their frequency and now they sound like a Mickey Mouse whale? So those are the types of questions that we want to look at. So finally, just to wrap up, I'm going to talk a little bit about mother calf pairs and right whales. And so the motivation for this study is, again, sort of conservation-based. Human caused mortality for right whales between 2001 and 2007, there were 18 cat right whales killed. And so um, these are 18 individuals that were dead, and they were able to do um, necropsies, necropsies on some of them to determine cause of death, but not all of them. It was about 30 or 40 percent ship strike, 20 percent um, entanglement, and then some unknown mortality as well. But what was striking to me was that the, the, the age and sex of the animals that died were predominantly adult females and their calves. So some of these were fetuses and that were near term and females that were hit by ships. Um, there were a lot of calves that washed up uh, on the beach hit by ships. There were females um, that weren't pregnant that were hit, but essentially there was just this, this big loss to the population of, of a lot of mature reproductive females and their offspring. And so what was happening with mother and calf pairs that might cause this? I mean, it's not a small, I mean, okay, 18 maybe is a small sample size. I work in whale world, so that's a lot of whales. Um, when you're working with a species that has a potential biological removal of 0.8, 18 of them dying is a big deal. And so what I was interested in is, is, is there something about females that have calves with them that makes them behave in such a way that they're more prone to getting hit by ships. And so, so that, that's sort of the motivation behind the study. So um, we're also interested in what sounds mother calf pairs made. I've talked a little about a passive acoustic monitoring. Um, this is a, a figure from the Cornell Autobuies um, that was published in the Marine Ecology, Ecology Progress Series. So these little red whales are right whale detections, and so there are these auto buoys in the shipping lanes for Boston that are constantly listening for right whales, and there's an automatic detector on board, and when they detect a right whale call, um, they actually phone home with cell service and send that clip to a, an operator, and that operator will put out an alert to mariners that goes out to all mariners that there's a right whale in the area, and that alert stays active for 24 hours. So if you want to know if right whales are in Cape Cod Bay, you can actually go, I think the website's called listenforwhales.net, you can just go right watch.org. Okay. Well, listen for whales. If you just listen for whales in Google, you'll find it. Um, but you can go and see, are there any right whales in Stellar and Bank detected in the past 24 hours? Um, and this is sort of going on all the time as a conservation effort. The thing is that we know that mothers can make up calls, but we don't know when they make up calls. We don't know how often they make up calls. So that was another motivation for this study is, do mothers and their calves actually make this sound that would make them detectable, or are they acoustically quiet? You could think of a, a rationale for a mother to not want to attract other individuals to her when there's a, a calf present. And so there's some thought that mothers and calves might be really silent. And so passive acoustic monitoring would totally miss this sort of critical part of the, of the population. And so that was another motivation for the study. Um, so as I said, we want to characterize the behavior that makes them more susceptible to collisions with vessels, characterize their vocal behavior to see if we can detect them acoustically. And then I'm also interested in personal name vocal development of calves. So whether there's um, an ontogeny of the, of the sound production in calves, because previous research that I've done with calves shows that calves make adult-like sounds, 
but they're higher in frequency and, and sort of longer and more tremulous than the sounds made by adults. So it would be interesting to see how that changes with the cast maturity. So the research plan for this project is actually a ton of field work. Um, so we're following calves from birth to weaning. And so essentially we do field work in the calving grounds in the southeast from January to March. Um, and then we move up to Cape Cod Bay in April and May to see them when they come in there for feeding. And then we go up to the Bay of Fundy to follow them there. So we're looking at the calf from about one, one day, some of them, um, to nine or 10 months of age. And uh, the majority of calves seem to wean between 10 and 12 months. So data collection for 2011 and 2012, we were starting out in the first two years just trying to get baseline data. It was sort of new for me because people didn't really know much about what other calf parents do. So we had to start by figuring that out. Um, so the project involved following mother calf pairs around just to see what they do um, and towing an acoustic monitoring device, a uh, hydrophone uh, array behind us so we could detect any calls they produce. So the season so far, um, you guys probably pay attention to weather a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed, the past two years have been a little weird um, in terms <laughs> of meteorological events. but. Anyways, so in 2011, we went down to Florida and Georgia and Cape Cod Bay and the Bay of Fundy to find whales. And we mainly found wind and rain, and more wind and more rain, <laughs> and then fog um, for like all of May, April and May. So we didn't get a whole lot, well, we didn't get as much done as we had hoped. And then 2012, which we were sure was going to be better because how could it be as bad as 2011? <laughs> um, so we had wind, rain, wind, fog, and, uh, and, and there were only seven cats born to the entire North um, which was not so good. The good news is there's already been a calf born this year, so we're really optimistic because it's super early for them to be calves, and there are already three females in the southeast, so we're like every day getting updates about how many calves are being born. Um, but in spite of all that, we actually had a lot of data when I sat down and, and compiled it. So we have 22 focal follows from 11 different mother calf pairs, which I was really, really impressed with when we actually added up. And we have 72 hours of behavioral observations um, and 60 hours of acoustics recording. Um, this is showing just sort of the distribution of our hours of observation. So from the southeast US, we have 16 hours last year, 32 hours this year, Cape Cod Bay, we won't talk about. Um, and then the Bay of Fundy, 20 hours uh, to the last year, nine hours this year. Um, so Cape Cod Bay hasn't been working out so well for us. It should be easy because my collaborators are at NOAA in Woods Hole. Like they just have to put the boat on a trail or go up to Cape Cod Bay, but no mother calf pairs have come into Cape Cod Bay in two years. So we're sort of reevaluating that part of the project. What's interesting though is if we look at what the mother calf pairs are, are spending their time doing, this is sort of where the conservation behavior comes in. So resting is this color. They all seem to, probably to you too, they all look the same to me from here, so hopefully you can tell. I'll just walk you through. So most of the time is spent resting at the surface, a little time nursing, some time traveling, feeding, and socializing. But if you divide it between the southeast, which is when the calf is first born, and the Bay of Fundy, when the calf is ready to wean, in the southeast, 75% of the time is spent sitting at the surface, just sitting there, resting. So um, in the southeast, it seems like there might be an increase for ship strength because of the behavior of the calf. The mom and the calf are staying at the surface for a lot of time, not moving. And they're spending some of their time um, nursing and some of their time traveling. Um, and a little bit of time socializing, but not much time feeding. So feeding is referring to the mother feeding or the calf taking dives feeding when it's getting closer to independence. In the Bay of Fundy, it changes. There's reduction in resting, so they're resting for about a third of the time, and then they're actually spending a lot more time um, socializing and traveling in the Bay of Fundy. So the calf is more independent. The calf spends a lot of time by itself sort of flopping out of the surface, breaching and flipper slapping and doing all sorts of crazy things and the mom's off feeding. Um, and so there's a big change between the southeast and funding. What we really want is what's happening in between these two points. So we're hoping we're gonna try to do the Great South Channel this year, um, this coming year, and Cape Cod Bay in hopes of, of finding some other calf pairs. In terms of uh, sound um, from mother calf pairs, remember, uh, remember how much sound right whales make compared to humpbacks? That's how much sound mother calf pairs make compared to right whales. So, um, if you didn't catch that. So 222 calls out of 60 hours of recording, and most of that came from individual bouts when they were uh, socializing with other whales. So in the southeast, we have a total of six calls from about 650 hours of data, um, and all came from a curious approach when the calf came over the boat and checked out the hydrophones. Other than that, we've heard nothing from a mother calf pair in the southeast. So they're sitting at the surface, not moving, and not making any sound. 
which is great. Um, Bay of Fundy, we're getting some sounds when they're feeding, some when they're socializing, some when they're traveling. But again, not a whole lot of calls, but we are getting, you know, 216 calls in the Bay of Fundy from only about 19 hours of recording compared to uh, six calls in the southeast. So here are our uh, call and answer in the Bay of Fundy. Um, this was a mother that was about a mile away from her cat and the cat calling an answer. So the blue are the mother and the yellow is the cat. So that's the mom. The cat. So that's our jewel in terms of, of our data collection, in terms of acoustics. So we're trying to focus on other things. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Behavior and sound production are tied to calf maturity. Behavioral activities seem to change as calf gets older, and not surprising, but it's kind of interesting to quantify it. And sound production increases with increasing calf maturity. The calves start making crazy sounds when they're, they're getting closer to weaning. Um, so those trends are great to see. Um, it's not really getting at the ship strike issue. The thing that we're trying to get at now are, there are biopsies collected every year from the calves when they're born and from their moms if they haven't been sampled. And so the behavior that we have been seeing from other boats and what we actually want to quantify is um, this has happened before in tagging attempts. If you head toward the mother calf pair with a boat, the mother will put herself perpendicular to you, between you and the calf. So if you're going to get have a large ship coming through an area and a mom's trying to protect her calf, if that's her behavioral response to a perceived threat, that could be explaining um, a lot of this calf mor mother calf mortality. But the calves are going to die if their mothers die because they're not independent and they, they're still nursing until the calf's about eight or nine months old. But we, we want to sort of look at this sort of protective behavior of the mother, um, seeing how she responds to threats in the environment. So tying it all together, behavior in Bailey and male conservation. So with all these projects, looking at diving and feeding behavior, we can get at vessel strike and entanglement risk from just, just looking at the dive behavior of individuals. We can also get detectability from this dive and feeding behavior. How much time are they visible at the surface? So how easy are they to find? And acoustically, we can get an idea of their detectability for passive acoustic monitoring. If they're easy to listen for, that might be a great way to determine if they're in the area, even in real-time monitoring. Right whale's real-time monitoring, the, the method that they have now of if you've heard any right whale call in 24 hours, the alert is on, is really probably the best strategy. They're not going to get a whale's calling, it's in the channel right now, you just slow down for this 10 minute period, because the call rates are so low, that's never going to work. And in terms of acoustic communication, we can also look at impacts of human-generated noise. I've been involved in a couple of other studies that are looking at stress hormones in whales, and so there was a publication earlier this year that um, actually used the September 11th recordings um, for my thesis. So I had recordings from August and September of 2001, um, and there was another group there doing fecal hormone analysis and um, tying the two data sets together along with the number of ships that were in the bank. There was a really large drop in fecal um, stress hormones after September 11th, and the only thing that we can find that's different that year from other years is the number of ships and the level of noise change. And so it suggested that there might be a, a chronic stress factor coming into this noise impact, whether it's from the noise itself or it's from the stress of trying to compensate for the noise to communicate, we're not sure. So just to finish off, behavioral studies are critical, I think, to targeted conservation efforts. And this is a figure actually from Skomal et al. Uh, talking about basking sharks. And so this is an interesting figure showing the, the known distribution or of basking sharks. And then these dotted lines are connecting the dots between locations the basking sharks were, sharks were tagged and where the tags were recovered. And so these sharks all went from coastal US waters down to the southern hemisphere. And so no one ever knew that there was this type of migration until that people were able to find the technology to track their behavior. And actually they're learning that these sharks are able to go in deep water to the southern hemisphere across the equator. And so it's really interesting but it's a kind of conservation concern that you wouldn't have been aware of if you didn't know that they had this migration behavior or you attacked individuals and you cited them. So lack of data on behavioral ecology really may hamper research and conservation efforts for a lot of species, and this is particularly true in the marine environment. We really know so little about the behavior of most marine organisms, and, it's, and there's been sort of an explosion or a revolution now with the tools that are available. And so there's so many questions open um, to improve our understanding of different species by learning more about their behavior and using these new tools. Um, to that point. And in an emerging research area, I really think that this is an important emerging research area because it's really going to refine our ability to assess our impacts on different organisms because you really need a baseline behavior to be able to understand 
what they do and it's important for management and conservation. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and thank everybody who's participated in this research and funded it um, over the past 10 years. Thanks very much. You got some time for some questions? Um, when you're talking about the noises that the humpbacks are making when they're feeding at night, the, the, the clicks, yeah. uh, you said they aren't very loud. What, how loud are they uh, about in terms of source level? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the goal, what band that you want it. it. We can't really do, it, it's relative because again, it's the same problem that's on the tag that's on the back of the humpback whale, so I can't give you a source level, but it's about 30 dB quieter than their social system. Okay. Broad band. You have such trouble with the right whales with the tagging. Are you going to try to find a different type of tag to use on the right whales, or are you just going to keep sticking them, stick them on? Um, well, that project's over. Um, so, uh, and I'm never going to try to put suction cup tags on right whales for nighttime data again, um, just because it's really frustrating. And I wasn't the only one that had that problem. There was another researcher, Mark Baumgartner from Latoll, who was doing the same type of study on um, in the Great South Channel, and he couldn't. He, his tags were staying on for like half an hour. Um, and so suction cup tags on right whales in that particular behavioral feeding don't seem to work very well, but I'm not really comfortable poking holes in this, such an endangered species, so someone else is. If, if it's important, someone else is gonna do it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so you showed the humpback whales going down to the bottom at night. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that that's because sand lamps go into the sand at night. What, is, what do humpback whales in Alaska do where they're chasing herring? I don't know, I mean, this is something that Joe and I have been talking about and I didn't talk about here. Our data from April, they don't seem to be feeding on sand lamps. It seemed like there was a lot of herring around and so the, the behavior is a little bit different. Um, and so one thing that's really interesting now that there are enough data that have been collected, I don't know about Alaska, I don't know if you guys had tags for that, but Cape Cod Bay, Stalagon Bay, Antarctica, um, and a couple of other places, their, their tags on forage and humpbacks, Australia now. And so it's interesting to look at how the behavioral strategies change depending on the prey dynamics. So it really depends on what the prey is doing. It wouldn't make sense for them to be bottom feeding on herring. But so, yeah, it's also like yeah. the Alaskan is a larger group, like usually eight to 12 animals working. Well, during the day, but I don't know if anyone knows what they do at night. Oh, yeah. Well, so, but uh, Duke, uh, Ari and Dave were up there this winter, summer. Okay. And they, I think we now have 10 data. Yeah. So I just think one implication is that in, in, rather than just sort of that at night they go and bottom feed. Oh, no, no, this was you, just in Stellagen Bank at that time of year. That's while there are a lot of sand dunes, right, because right. there are sort of these, you know, decadal changes in the environment. Right. Yeah, no, and sorry if I didn't make that point clear, but it was because of the prey behavior the same way that the right whales are, are staying just subsurface in Cape Cod Bay only at the time when the Calumet's Cocoa Harbor just subsurface. And so what Joe and I are working on is how does that change with the, the prey behavior and the prey availability? Yeah. One last question. Um, when you played the, the rhythmic uh, sounds were on the bottom, mm -hmm. and you said they could be uh, scaring the prey out of the sand, the rhythm, the, the regular sound of that almost is, is reminiscent of a, a bottom profiler. Could mm -hmm. they actually be profiling the sediments themselves to judge them where to feed? Yeah, I mean, that was the initial, um, Allison Snipper wrote a paper that I think is also called mega clicks. Mm -hmm. she called, they're louder, mega clicks are Yeah, louder. the frequency was a little low, but Yeah, but higher. these frequencies are really low, and the intensities, I mean, they're whisper quiet. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're so much quieter than the other sounds, and so it, to me it seems really unlikely that they're using it for echolocation capabilities. We would um, just judge the sediment type. That's possible, though they are, like, dragging their, their flippers through yeah. the sand, so <laughs> they probably also have all their cues. Yeah. So if there are further questions, you're welcome to join us in the Akubu room for lunch, and let's just thank Susan one more time.